It is tragic that among all the men scurrying about the tiny continental islands of our water planet, too few are able to sense the serum coursing in their veins. Too few who can feel, I am the sea and the sea is me. But Jacques Cousteau was not the only one who cared about the big blue. Ed Annunciata was also fascinated by the ocean which shines through in his underwater saga, Echo the Dolphin. However, when he described the game's concept to his boss at Sega of America, it was received with skepticism. It took him a full year to convince Sega to allow him to build a prototype, and once the basic gameplay mechanics were demonstrated, Sega took the risk and greenlit the project. The development of Echo the Dolphin was handled by the talented crew of the Hungarian studio, Novatrade. As the game starts, Echo, a young bottlenose dolphin, loses his family in a giant storm. The developers cleverly avoided cutscenes or an introduction to spell out what happened, choosing instead to leave the player in Echo's bare home bay with little information to go on. This evokes a sense of isolation and mystery and makes the player connect with our dolphin and his quest, and combined with the often melancholic and ominous mood of the soundtrack effectively conveys that darkness. In each level, you must navigate Echo through an underwater maze filled with foes and puzzles. Strong currents, spiky shells, and a giant octopus are just a few of the obstacles Echo faces. He can charge to attack the hungry ones and eat small fish to recover strength, but he needs to surface from time to time to get a breath of air. This gameplay element adds a sense of tension while navigating through the underwater mazes, which are often quite complex and treacherous. Echo's first objective is finding Big Blue, a wise whale that spends his last days in the northern seas. He reveals that there's a wiser and more ancient life form that might know what caused the giant storm, known as the Asterite. Once the story continues, more fantastical elements are introduced, like the lost city of Atlantis and the concept of time traveling, but they're handled with great care and never feel out of place in Echo's mystical world. The rich backstory is telegraphed via glyph crystals that store messages from past life forms and civilizations, providing subtle context to the world in a similar way a game like Dark Souls does. Echo's impressive visuals have a certain painted quality, which isn't surprising, considering the work of famous Czech illustrator Zdenek Burian served as a reference and a source of inspiration. Oh, and as a side note, the Pterodon never actually lived in the Jurassic era. The game has 25 levels, and before reaching the alien Vortex Queen, the source of the mysterious storm, the player's skills and patience are sure to be tested. Developers often made their games really challenging to prevent players from completing it during a single rental, but one might argue that they went a little too far with Echo, as some levels caused the player an unreasonable amount of frustration. But to truly appreciate Echo, you have to look beyond some of the technical issues, as it has more to offer, like the unique storyline, setting, and atmosphere. Sega backed up the launch with a good amount of marketing, since they knew they had something special in their hands. Day 19. I am concerned about the crew. After all, Echo the Dolphin is not just a game, it is an adventure. The graphics are so real, they don't want to go into the sea anymore. 27 levels of danger, mystery, and beauty, all through the eyes of a dolphin. Simply brilliant. The game helped the company to differentiate itself further from the cuteness of Nintendo titles with more mature and unique content. By 1992, Nintendo had lost substantial ground to Sega. Our Little Dolphin certainly helped to achieve this success. The unique theme and rave reviews in magazines helped to bring the Dolphin's adventure to many gamers' homes. A story adaptation was even told in comic book form in Sega's Sonic the Comic publication. And with the success of Echo, it was only a matter of time until a sequel would surface. Tides of Time, released in 1994, was supervised by the same core development team. As the title might suggest, the game and story focus heavily on time traveling. The Vortex Queen survived Echo's attack and secretly followed him to Earth. Her plan was to destroy the asteroid so that Echo never obtained his powers that lead to the destruction of her planet. This act split the stream of time in two. One is a peaceful future, while in the other, Earth's seas are ruled by the Vortex kind. There was overall more variety added to the game. At various points, Echo can shapeshift, transforming him into a seagull, a shark, and even into a school of fish. 
Other new additions included the 3D perspective levels to travel from one area to the next, giving the player a sense of perspective. The graphics were greatly enhanced with more realistic dolphin sprites and more fluid animations, making it arguably one of the best-looking games on the Mega Drive. The difficulty level was also toned down a bit. It features some challenging levels, but nothing quite as insane as the first game. Tides of Time was actually meant to be the second act in a trilogy, as the game ends on a cliffhanger where Echo seems to be lost in time and the Vortex Queen is trapped in Earth's past. But to this day, the third chapter hasn't been made, although the basic outline was already written. Tides of Time pushed the series further, but the time-traveling aspect made the story a bit hard to follow. Both Echo titles got 8-bit conversions, which were pretty faithful to the originals, considering the hardware limitations. There were also enhanced ports for Sega's Mega CD and Windows, with added content in the form of new levels, movie clips, and a new CD-quality soundtrack by Spencer Nilsson. In 1995, Sega finally catered toward a younger audience with Echo Jr., a lighthearted adventure that was also available for the education system, the Sega Pico. With the introduction of the Sega Saturn, anticipation began to build for the first 3D outing in the series, but the development crew at Novatrade had a hard time creating a lush underwater world on the console, so the project got cancelled during an early stage. The wait was for a new console with enough power to realize their grand vision, the Dreamcast. Defender of the Future was headed by a new creative team and writer, and can be considered a reboot. Most gameplay elements were successfully transferred to the 3D world, such as starting out in the tropical reefs where the player can slowly get accustomed to the new controls. Once again, time travel is a central theme, but whereas humans were absent in previous games, the bond between humans and dolphins is an overarching story detail, making way for imitative settings for the player to swim through. The development process was somewhat troublesome, especially since the project lacked focus in terms of gameplay. The team wasn't always sure what direction to take. Should it be a hardcore action title, an adventure game like Zelda, or perhaps a glorified tech demo? But all things considered, Defender of the Future is still a unique, gorgeous, and beautiful sounding game that continues the tradition of being pretty damn hard. It was received positively by gaming press and players alike, but had a hard time finding a target audience, resulting with this as Echo's final adventure. Sega never again dared to take on similar risks, as the Echo series of games were not designed with widespread appeal in mind. Instead, the developers took the leap and produced a game that breeds a mystical atmosphere, thus becoming one of the most memorable and artistic games of its era. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoy classic gaming documentaries like this one, be sure to check out other videos including Secret of Mana, Castlevania, Thunder Force, or MSX Konami games.